good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me first thank the uh, organizers for uh, giving me the uh, uh, room to talk here. So what I will uh, talk about is primordial black holes and how they may form in the early universe uh, in the regime where quantum back reaction is important and where it can be modeled using this formalism of stochastic inflation that I will introduce. So what I, what I will try, try to show is that uh, tools that have been developed in stochastic analysis in other contexts and for other uh, purposes can be useful in the context of cosmology. So the outline of my presentation is the following. I will first explain in which quantum state cosmological perturbations are placed in the early universe and why this quantum state allows one to describe them using a stochastic uh, classical description, which is rather non-trivial and which is related to very specific properties of this quantum state. And this gives rise to the so-called stochastic inflation formalism in which one can account for the back reaction of those perturbations onto the background dynamics, giving rise in some cases to the production of uh, primordial black holes. So the results I will show have been obtained in collaboration with uh, Alexei Starobinsky, Hushiara Sadulai, David Wons, and Chris Pattison from the University of Portsmouth in the UK, and uh, Hassan Hasadulai and Mardiar Norbala from the uh, uh, University of, uh, of uh, Tehran. So first of all, a very brief uh, recap on inflation itself. So inflation is a phase of a very high energy accelerated expansion that took place in the very early universe, during which the double time derivative of the scale factor is accelerating. And during this, during this epoch, uh, there is a wavelength, the Hubble radius, which characterizes the curvature of space-time, A over A dot, which is almost a constant in such a way that if one takes a, uh, for instance, a scalar field, a quantum field, and decomposes it into uh, different wave numbers, different Fourier modes, at the, in the early time limit, uh, a given wavelength will be inside the Hubble radius, so it fills something which is locally a flat space-time, so you can set initial conditions into a vacuum state there. And then as the expansion proceeds, this mode will cross out the Hubble radius and start to feel the curvature of space-time. And when you have a quantum field on top of a curved space-time, something you typically uh, have is particle production, which here corresponds to the amplification of cosmological fluctuations that you can later see either on the cosmic microwave background and isotropies or in the large-scale structure of the universe. And the, property, the statistical properties of these fluctuations as predicted by this mechanism matches very well what we observe in the universe. So this is one of the reasons why inflation is an interesting uh, idea to play with. Of course, if one wants to define the background as being made of the degrees of freedom of the theory, which are above the, cost, above the Hubble radius, because of this continuous inflow of modes inside the super Hubble sector, one has some quantum back reaction of these fluctuations onto the background. And, um, and so, and we are going to try and describe them with a stochastic uh, description. But let me first explain why we can do that, which is related to what specific properties these fluctuations have. So here I'm going to talk about scalar fluctuations uh, only for simplicity. And if inflation is driven by a single scalar field, there is only one gauge invariant scalar degree of freedom, which here I will call V for the Muhan of Sasaki variable, but it's basically just something which is proportional to zeta, which you may be more familiar with for the curvature of fluctuation. And on super Hubble scales, it's also something which is related to the temperature uh, fluctuation, the one that you see on the cosmic microwave background. So the idea is that we take uh, the background to be classical and we quantify zeta. And what we obtain is the following. So what we obtain is that the wave function so the wave functional of this variable V can be decomposed into the product on, of wave functions for each wave number K, where Psi K here is given by this expansion. So it's a sum on states which contain N particles in K and N particles in minus K. So the fact that you can build a state out of this uh, ket here is just related to statistical isotropy. Because of statistical isotropy, whenever you produce a particle with, mem with momentum k, you need to produce a particle with momentum minus k, so, which is what this, this formula is, ten is telling you here. And the coefficients in this expansion depend on two parameters, rk and phi k, 
which are called the squeezing uh, parameters for a reason that I will explain in a minute. So now, instead of working with the wave function, um, another tool to describe the state of these perturbations is uh, something which is called the Wigner function, which, as you can see, is just a function in the coordinates of phase space. So Vk is my Mukhanov sasaki variable. P is just the momentum conjugated to V. And this function of, of phase space is just built from the wave function by doing some sort of uh, Fourier transform, if you wish. The only thing that matters is that uh, all the information about psi is contained in W. So if you want to work with a quantum state, you can either work with the wave function. You can also work with the density matrix, if you prefer. You can also work with the Wigner function. It's, uh, it's basically dealing with the same quantity. And so uh, what you can do is to derive a time evolution equation for W. You just write dW over dt. It will give a deep psi over dt. Here, uh, you use Schrodinger equation, and what you obtain is that dW over dt is just given by the uh, Poisson bracket between W and H. Um, this holds for quadratic Hamiltonians, and here my Hamiltonian is quadratic just because I'm working at linear order in perturbation theory. So what this equation is telling you, so this is a mathematical equation, okay? What this is telling you physically is the following. So imagine that um, I start from my vacuum state, so I know what the wave function is in the vacuum, and then I can compute my Wigner function, which looks something like that. It's a Gaussian function, so it's always positive in the V and P space. Okay, and then I can, I use my Schrodinger equation, I evolve the wave function, so I can compute W at some later times, and what happens is the following. So as you move on and cross out the Hubble radius, you see that this uh, function is rotating, and also it gets very squeezed in one direction and very spread in the other direction. That's the reason why we call this a squeezed state, because of the shape of the Wigner function. Okay, now let's do something different. Let's start again from the initial Wigner function. And because it's a positive function, let's imagine just for one minute that it's a distribution function. Let us view it as a distribution function. And let's draw points in phase space, some set of points, I don't know, maybe 200 points here, according to that function. And then, for each of these points individually, let's apply the classical equations of motion. So I'm going to move on to move the location of these points all one by one using just uh, the Hamilton's equations. And what I, sorry, this is not, the battery is dead maybe. What you obtain is the, I don't know, sorry about that. Yeah, what you obtain is the following. So each point is moving, and you see that the cloud of points is reproducing something that looks familiar because it's a little bit the same like this. So it gets, it's rotated, it gets squeezed in one direction and, what's, and, and spread in the other direction. So this is exactly what this equation is telling you. This equation is telling you that if you wait a little bit and you take the evolved cloud of points and you reconstruct the function that it mimics, the distribution that it mimics, then you obtain your Wigner function exactly. Okay, so this is already something which is telling you that indeed there is the possibility to describe the dynamics of this state using some sort of classical picture. That's one ingredient, but the other ingredient is, is the following one. So imagine that W is really a distribution function in phase space. What you should be able to do in principle is if you're interested in the predicted value of some quantum operator O, for instance. So quantum mechanically, what you will do is just compute the mean value of O in your state um, so you will sandwich O by the wave function. But if W is really a distribution function, what you should be able to do is compute the, the mean value of O by just integrated O in phase space against W. And in general, these two quantities are completely different in quantum mechanics, um, just because quantum mechanics is not equivalent to a stochastic theory. But one can show that in the large squeezing limit, which corresponds to the super Hubble limit, so if you spend at least a few e-folds outside the Hubble radius, for a very large subset of operators, almost all operators O, this becomes almost an equality. Okay? So what this is telling you is that, um, basically, if you look at perturbations far outside the Hubble radius, you can describe their dynamics using a theory which is stochastic and classical. Stochastic because W can be interpreted as a distribution function, and classical because it follows classical equations of motion from this result here. And so the idea is uh, to make use of that to derive the stochastic inflation formalism. So 
We know that the scales that we probe in uh, cosmological experiments, for instance, the cosmic microwave background, they are super Hubble at the end of inflation, so we know that we should be able to describe them with, this cl with a classical stochastic theory. And the idea is to start from, um, say, the inflaton field, phi of x, which you uh, 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 decompose into Fourier modes, and to take all the modes which are inside some coarse graining scale. So theta here is a window function which selects the mode k which are larger than the co-moving uh, Hubble scale, so ah times some parameter sigma that is going to be irrelevant for us. Uh, and to take all of these modes inside a small wavelength spot and to keep the rest as being the coarse grain field. And, uh, and so the idea is to derive an effective theory for the coarse grain field by integrating out the small, the, the small wavelength and the, the thing that we would like to achieve is that, again, because we know that the long wavelengths behave as a classical stochastic system, this effective theory, we expect it to be a classical stochastic theory. So there are, of course, lots of details behind this and how you do that exactly, but let me just jump to the result and give a very heuristic uh, sense of what's going on. So basically, if you take the equation of motion for the field phi written in the Stroboll approximation, so you only have a first time derivative here, what you obtain is the standard equation plus a right-hand side which, in which you have the, the small wavelength uh, modes. And the expression of this right-hand side is given by the following thing. So the details do not really matter. The only thing which is important here is the d over dt acting on my window function. So what, what it is telling you is the following. Because, like I said before, modes uh, smaller than the coarse graining scale, they constantly escape from the, uh, uh, from the sub-Hubble sector to source the coarse grain sector. What you have is a, is a term which appears here and which corresponds to the new modes that get into the coarse grain field. So because of the way you have defined the coarse grain field by construction, uh, at every time step, you have new degrees of freedom that join the system, and this, of course, changes the system in some way. And this is what this psi one quantity is mimicking. So, so far everything is quantum operators, but now I'm going to do the non-trivial thing, uh, which is very schematic here, but which uh, okay, requires a little bit more of analysis in practice, which is to replace this quantum operator by just a stochastic variable, using the fact that, again, I expect my theory to be classical and stochastic. And so when I do that, this equation becomes a stochastic equation, which is called the Langevin equation. And I'm going to use that for the rest of the, of the talk. So what's the connection with promodal black holes? Remember, there was promodal black holes in my, in my, uh, in my title. So promodal black holes may form um, in the very early universe when perturbations re-enter the Hubble radius after inflation. So when re perturbations re-enter the Hubble radius during inflation, delta rho over rho at that time is of the order of the curvature uh, perturbation. And if the curvature perturbation is larger than some critical value, which is typically of order one or point one, um, then you may collapse and form a black hole. The reason why stochastic inflation is important to describe this mechanism is that if uh, curvature fluctuation are not large, but not completely small, not very, very small, then you do expect some quantum back reaction, just because the amplitude of these modes, which source the coarse grain sector, is going to be larger. So you expect the influence of this new stochastic term to be more important. So in other words, if one wants to compute properly the probability that these large, cur this somewhat large cur curvature fluctuations form during inflation, one has to include the stochastic effect to do that properly. And this is what I'm going to show. So before uh, moving down to here, just to say that usually what people do is they compute the mass fraction which is defined in the following way. So if you take the probability distribution of having a certain value of, the, of zeta, the curvature of fluctuation, and if this uh, denotes uh, zeta c, you just integrate the PDF above zeta c, and you call this beta, the mass fraction, which is basically the fraction of the um, um, universe that collapses and forms black holes at a given mass. And the mass here is uh, given by the mass contained inside the Hubble patch when the mode that you consider uh, re-enters the Hubble radius. So we have observatory constraints on this beta quantity that depend on the mass. Here I just quote the number 10 to the minus eight. In fact, this upper bound here strongly depends on the mass. It can go 
um, uh, down to uh, values which are much smaller than that. But as you will see in the very end, the conclusion do not depend strongly on the number that I use this. So just remember that beta is a number that should be less than one. Uh, it is in fact sufficient for what I'm going to discuss. So the idea now is to use stochastic inflation to basically compute this probability distribution function to extract the mass fraction and to compare it with observations. So in order to do that, I'm going to use a last uh, kind of uh, ingredient, which is something called the delta rent formalism, and which is a result in cosmological perturbation theory, where one can show that the curvature of fluctuation is the same as the fluctuation in the number of e-folds n. So something I should maybe have written down is that n is just the log of the scale factor, the number of e-folds between a slice which is initially spatially flat and a final slice which is uniform in energy density. Okay, so you have this correspondence. Um, but if you think about the Langevin equation, in fact, this equation is uh, giving you a quantity which looks like a stochastic duration. So in, what I mean is that if you solve your, the dynamics bet between two fixed points in the potential, say that you start at a given point in the potential and that you end inflation when you reach the final point, because the equation is stochastic, the duration of that process, so the number of e-folds elapsed during the whole period, is going, be, is going to be a stochastic quantity. If I solve my Langevin equation again, I will get a different number again and again and again. So I can reconstruct, in principle, this delta n quantity, so the difference between n, which here is, uh, I write uh, with a curl n just to stress the fact that it's a stochastic quantity, minus the mean value of it. And the idea is to use my Langevin equation to compute that quantity, to compute the statistics of this quantity, and to infer the statistics of the curvature fluctuations, and hence to compute the mass fraction. Okay. So this quantity depends on the field value that you start from. And um, one can show, in fact, we have shown with uh, uh, Alexei Staromilsky in 2015, that the moments of that number, so the nth moment of n, uh, follows a differential equation, which is the following. So you see it's a differential equation which relates the moment of order n to the moment of order n minus 1, and which contains derivative with respect to the field value that you start from. So it's an iterative set of equations that what you can do, for instance, is start from n equals 1. So if n equals 1, this is just, the right-hand side here is just 1. So the right-hand side is, is, I mean, it's 1 over v, but... I mean, the mean value here is just one. And so you have a differential equation for the mean number of e-folds that you can solve. Then if you plug the solution in the right-hand side, you can solve the equation again and, and get the, the, the mean value of the number of e-folds squared, so on and so forth. So when you do that, for example, um, you, can comp you can show that in some limit to be carefully defined, uh, you can recover the standard formula for the power spectrum. So the power spectrum is related to the mean value of uh, delta n squared. It's the typical uh, amplitude of the fluctuation. And there is a classical limit in which you recover the standard uh, so rule formula. Otherwise, you get corrections to it that you can compute, so on and so forth. However, what we want to do here is not only compute the moments only of that distribution, because what we want to do is integrate the full PDF on the tail. So knowing just a few first moments of the distribution is not enough. We need to have a handle on the shape of the entire tail. But this can be worked out uh, using uh, the characteristic function. So what I do is I define a function chi of a dummy parameter t, which is nothing but the, the mean value of exponential i t n. So by construction, it's just the integral of exponential i t n times the PDF. And then if I tailor expand this exponential, because of the mean value here, you see that I will have a polynomial in t and the coefficients in this expansion are going to be related to the moments of uh, n, of the, of the stochastic variable n. But because I have an equation for these moments, I can use that equation and show that chi itself uh, follows a differential equation as well, which is an ordinary differential equation, but uh, so a single one, but of course, which depends on this parameter t. So I've replaced my infinite set of uh, differential, ordinary differential equations um, my hierarchy of differential equations by a single one, but of course I have to solve it for each value of t. But still one can solve that equation and uh, one can solve it analytically in some cases, and uh, once you have the characteristic function, the way that you go back to the distribution function p itself is just by noticing that this equation is telling you nothing uh, 
but the fact that chi is the Fourier transform of P. So if you inverse Fourier transform chi, you get, uh, you get P. So the recipe is the following. You solve that equation, then you inverse Fourier transform chi, you obtain the PDF, and then you integrate the PDF above some threshold value, and you get the mass fraction of pyramidal black holes. Okay, that's the, that's the story. So now, let me apply this recipe to a concrete example to show you what's, what happens in practice. So I'm going to discuss a simple enough example just to keep things uh, simple. But of course, uh, one, can do, one can play the same game with more complicated setups. And in this example, I just assume that the potential for inflation is given by just a constant piece one plus a uh, monomial component. Okay, so the, the potential is just a constant plus phi to the p. And what typically happens in such models of inflation is that, uh, so of course, it, well, yeah, so what typically happens is that, okay, the, the inflaton rolls down the potential, and as the potential becomes flatter and flatter, the amplitude of perturbations becomes larger and larger, and so you expect at some point to seed the formation of black holes. And then, of course, in this model, inflation does not end, so you need to add some mechanism to end inflation, but that's something that I just, uh, that you can imagine you have your favorite ending ending inflation mechanism. So before um, showing you the result for the mass fraction, what I would like to show you is the result that you obtain for the power spectrum, just as, a, just as a way to get into the topic. So remember, I have my, uh, I have my hierarchy of uh, differential equations for the moment of the number of e folds. So I can solve the hierarchy two times. I obtain the mean number, the, the mean value of n squared. And then I can compute the power spectrum in that way. So this is a plot of the power spectrum as a function of the field value at which the mode that you are interested in uh, crosses out the Hubble radius. And the result is the full black line, so this line here. Okay? And the blue line, uh, which is this straight line over here, corresponds to the classical formula. So the formula that you obtain, neglecting the role of stochastic diffusion, this is just the, the standard through formula. And the green line, the green dashed line is just what you obtain by solving the kind of Saki equation. So the fact that the green and the blue agree is just telling you that uh, you are always in through There is no through violation here. So what you see that you have two domains in this curve. You have a uh, piece of the potential at large field value where the classical treatment is a valid one, at least to compute the power spectrum. And then I will. Uh, explain, I will comment on whether it's still valid to compute the mass fraction. That's another question. And then you have a, another regime where the uh, classical result does not apply. So in particular, if you trust the, classic, the standard formula, what you find is that at some point, the amplitude of perturbations become very, very large. But in fact, what you do obtain is that because of quantum back reaction, there is some kind of a maximum value that uh, the fluctuations cannot uh, cross, and you settle to a constant value here. The other thing is that one can compute analytically, because the power spectrum can be computed analytically in this model, one can compute the, the transition value at which you go from this classical to, to stochastic regime. And what you obtain is that it's the point and at which this equality is satisfied. So V squared V double prime is V prime squared. Okay, so typically you have to go to very, very flat potential. So V prime has to be very small because V is the potential in Planckian units. So it's typically a very small quantity. So the fact that it's given by something which is homogeneous to V cube on the left and, and, uh, and only V squared on the right is telling you that. But still, at some point, when the potential is really, really flat, this is what happens. Something I should also stress is that sometimes people say that stochastic um, uh, corrections are only important when the naive criterion is met. And what I call the naive criterion here is a criterion for eternal inflation, basically. So what people often say is that when the amplitude of, of quantum kicks is of the order or larger than the classical drift over one e-fold, which is the condition for realizing eternal inflation, then only then you do have large stochastic corrections. In fact, this is not the case. This is a different criterion that you need to use here. And the reason is that this eternal inflation criterion is derived on a time scale, which is one e-fold, which is not the time scale that is relevant for uh, what we are discussing here, which is the dynamics of perturbations. Anyway, so you can identify the region of the potential which is dominated by stochastic diffusion. And the red line on this plot corresponds to what you get if you assume that the potential is exactly flat in this region. 
that we call a quantum well. So it's the thing that I call delta phi well here. So if you assume that the potential is exactly flat, you get the red line and you see that it provides a good match to the actual result. So what this is telling you is that if I give you a potential, you can just compute this quantity. You see it's straightforward to compute, it's very easy. And uh, you can identify a region in which the classical formula for the power spectrum is going to be valid and other regions that you can just assume to be exactly flat because uh, you will not be able to tell the difference. Pardon? Ah, no, no, yes, yes, sorry, I should have said. So here is for, uh, I think the plot is for P equals three, uh, but it does not depend. I mean, of course, the details, the details of the plot will, but not the, not the main properties, yes. So let's now, yeah. Uh, yes, that's correct. Absolutely. Pardon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But you see, but you will see that the distribution in the end is completely non-Gaussian because the boundaries conditions play non-trivial role. But I will, yeah, I will. Yeah. Pardon. Um, well, yeah, usually that's what we assume because there is also a phase of large stochastic corrections at very, very large field. But here I'm looking at a model where um, I'm more interested in, some, in the, uh, something which is close to the end of inflation where before the end of inflation the potential becomes flatter and you have larger curvature fluctuations uh, as a candidate to later produce promodal black holes. Yes, so it, it's as a function of phi, and phi is the value at which the wave, so the power spectrum is a function of k in principle, the wave number. So here phi is the value of the field at which the wave number crosses out the Hubble radius. Uh, so each wave number crosses out the Hubble radius at a different time, and at that time the field value is different. And so this is just a way to label time, so it's a way to label k. Yes, that's correct. Yes. No, sorry, small scales are on, I'm sorry, small, I was, because I was looking that small scales are on the left. Because, because they, the inflaton goes down the potential, the so they, yes. The, small, the smaller wavelengths are on the left and the large wavelengths are on the right. Yes, yes. I'm interested in the, in the, in the tail, yes. So it's more dispersion than spike. So you're, you're not going to be necessarily in the, uh, in the small window in the origin. Well, I mean, if I take a given mode, uh, I compute the PDF of the fluctuation at that scale, and I'm interested on the tail of the distribution. Now, what this is showing is the, ampl is the mean, is the typical amplitude, so the, the second moment of that PDF, as a function of the scale. It's not, it's not something which, it's not a PDF, it's just a power spectrum. I will, I will show a PDF in a minute. Maybe it will be more intuitive, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just stuck on the fact that you're saying it could well be Gaussian, in which case it would be, the tail would be at e to the minus 180 or something. Yes, yes, no, no, but it's not going, but, but the PDF is going to be completely non-Gaussian. Oh, yeah, yeah, indeed. Otherwise, I could stop here, I agree. <laughs> But I'm not because I have 10 more minutes. <laughs> okay, so let's study these two regimes one by one. So first of all, the regime in which the, st the classical result for the power spectrum applied. So here is now a plot of the PDF of n, just rescaled by V0, but it does not really matter, for different values of uh, basically for different scales. And what you see here is that this PDF looks pretty much Gaussian. In fact, there is a way, so in this regime, things are analytical, uh, but expressed in terms of complicated integral. You can do some sort of a saddle point expansion in these integrals and show that at leading order, in some classical limit, you recover a Gaussian profile, and then if you go to next to leading order, you have a first non-Gaussian correction to it, so on and so forth. So you see that the Gaussian approximation to these curves is a good fit, um, but to be honest, this is just because I have plotted the distribution in the neighborhood of the maximum of the distribution. But remember that if you are interested in promodal black holes, which 
I'm sure you all are, uh, you have to look at the tail of the distribution. And in fact, if you look at the tail of the distribution, so it becomes more difficult to study numerically because, uh, okay, for some technical reasons, but the fits of that Gaussian uh, approximation and even the fit of the Gaussian approximation with the first non-Gaussian correction is very, very bad. Um, so what it means here is that, in fact, even in that regime, um, when you use the standard result based on the Gaussian uh, formula to uh, compute the mass fraction, uh, a priori, um, you don't really know whether it's a good, uh, or whether it provides a good order of magnitude for the, for the mass fraction. Okay, but this is something that, in fact, interestingly, is more difficult to study than the regime where things are dominated by stochastic diffusion. So I will just leave that question alone for the moment and move to the other regime. So this part of the potential, which you can, remember, just approximate as being flat, and where stochastic uh, corrections become important. So this is, again, a plot of the distribution function of the number of e folds, rescaled by some parameter mu. And each color here corresponds to a different initial value along this quantum well. So I think uh, the curves which are very red corresponds to starting close to this point, and the curves which are bluer and bluer corresponds to starting closer and closer to the end of inflation. Um, what is interesting here is that this uh, PDF is universal when you, once you have expressed things in terms of this rescaled quantity, which is the number of e-fold divided by mu squared. So mu squared is just the ratio between the, the width of the quantum well divided by the height, the potential height at which it, uh, it exists. So it's an analytical function, okay, a complicated one, but an analytical function. So you can study absolutely everything. And what you can do is uh, take uh, your uh, critical value, integrate after the critical value, and you obtain the mass fraction. So the mass fraction looks like this. So this is a plot of the mass fraction as a function of mu squared, because since the distribution is completely universal, it depends only on this mu squared parameter. And of course, it also depends on where you are in this uh, quantum well. But as you can see, it doesn't play a very big role. So the blue line here corresponds to starting close to the, uh, to the beginning of the well, and the green line corresponds to starting very close to the end of inflation. But you see that there is no very big difference between the two curves. So I don't know if uh, you can all see very well the numbers on that, on that plot, but let me just tell you what they are. So mu here goes from 10 to the minus 1, mu squared, sorry, goes from 10 to the minus 1 to 10. So mu varies by one order of magnitude, while beta goes from 10 to the minus 60 to 1. So there is a huge, huge, huge sensitivity on this uh, mu parameter. And this is the reason why I was saying at the beginning that, in fact, the constraint you take on beta, whether you say it's 10 to less than 10 to the minus 8 or less than 10 to the minus 20, depending on the mass at, at which you look at, does not play a big role because, in the end, the resulting constraint that you have on mu is pretty much the same. And it's just the fact that mu should be less than 1. Okay? That's the take-home message. And if you want to have something more physical to remember, in that case, in fact, because, again, everything, the distribution function is universal, it depends only on this mu parameter, all the quantities of interest are of order mu. So, for example, the mean number of e-folds spent in this quantum well is of order mu. So what this is telling you is that, uh, on average, uh, you should not spend more than one e-fold inside a region dominated by quantum diffusion. Otherwise, you would have uh, too many black holes afterwards, and you will not pass the observational constraints. So the, yeah. Right. Then you, then you agree that no abundance is tiny, right? Well, it depends. No, if you take mu to be a constant. Yeah, Sorry, if you take uh, p to be 0. Yeah, then yeah. No, no, well, then, no. yeah, so then the size of this quantum well becomes infinite. And uh, so you approach um, a constant value, which is typically of order 1. Yes, but yeah, but that's correct. But if the if the if the potential is exactly flat, so epsilon one equals uh, zero classically. So classically, the fluctuations are enormous. In practice, they are they are um, they, there is an upper bound on them because of stochastic diffusion, which prevents them from being infinite. But classically, if I have v prime equals zero, zeta is inf 
becomes infinite. Classically, the power spectrum for zeta is something like, uh, you know, it's something which goes like that. And then there is maybe uh, 8 pi squared or something. Classical. So in Strobel, if uh, epsilon 1 goes to 0, this becomes infinite. Of course, I'm not saying it's infinite. It's, it, it's finite because of stochastic diffusion, but. Yeah. So just to, to summarize what you have to do, if, 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 you, if you have an inflationary potential in mind, how much time do I have left? Ah, OK. Ah, OK, OK. It will be shorter. Um, is to do the following. So first, you look at uh, this criterion that I wrote. Uh, which allows you to identify the regions in the potential where the standard formula applies and the regions where you are dominated by quantum diffusion. And then basically once you know the size of the regions dominated by quantum diffusion and the value of the potential in these regions, you just compute this new parameter and you just compare it to one basically. If it's less than one, then it, your model is okay. If it's more than one, then you, um, you expect to produce too many promodal black holes. Okay, so in fact, I'm pretty much done, so I've been faster than what I expected. Uh, let me just summarize and, and give a few prospects. So the first thing I've tried to uh, convince you about is that uh, one needs the stochastic delta ren formalism in order to compute promodal black holes, because when one computes promodal black holes abundance, one needs to go beyond the perturbative approach, so incorporate the quantum back reaction of small fluctuations sourcing the coarse grain sector. Um, but that, in fact, even in the classical regime, so the regime where this formula for the power spectrum basically is the correct one, uh, one may still have to worry that the Gaussian approximation might fail on the tail. So you will always obtain something which is reliable for the power spectrum, but maybe not for the mass fraction. And in that case, one needs to design another expansion key scheme, which instead of expanding around the maximum of the distribution, expands on the tail of the distribution. So that's something that uh, we are working on at the moment to see in which cases it works, in which cases it does not. Um, and basically the take-home message is that the bounds we have at the moment on promodal black holes require to spend on average less than one fold in the regions dominated by uh, quantum diffusion. Now there are a few extensions to this work that we are uh, um, thinking about at the moment. The first one is um, how we could extend that to multiple fields. So if you have multiple fields, um, you typically expect non-trivial effects to take place. The equations can still be written down, but they become more complicated to solve, and they also have some uh, subtleties. Um, so yeah, this is something that uh, we look at at the moment. And the other thing is what happens if you have a, a violation of the rule um, as you would sometimes expect in the potential that I drew before, the potential that was given by a constant plus some large field piece. So if you extend this potential into an inflection point, for instance, a flat inflection point potential, uh, in some cases, when you roll down such a potential, uh, there is a phase close to the inflection point where you violate slow roll and you go into another phase, uh, which is sometimes known as ultra slow roll. So in that case, seems to become more complicated. Uh, one can still design a stochastic description, but there are some subtleties related to the gauge, to the choice of the gauge. And also, because you don't have the stroll attractor anymore, you have to solve the stochastic uh, equations in the full phase space. So this makes the equations a little bit uh, more difficult to tackle. But this, because this is a scenario which is often discussed for uh, producing promodal black holes, that's something that we are also looking at uh, at the moment. Okay, and I think I will uh, stop here, so yeah, thank you very much.